Good evening and welcome everyone to yet another week of Conservation Conversations. My name is Andrew de Bloch. I will be your host again tonight, making my second appearance instead of Dr. Melissa Howes Whitecross. Melissa has just got back from the field working on our Southern uh, Banded Snake Eagle project. And they successfully managed to uh, put tagging devices on two of the birds, which is very exciting. Um, and she was quite tired after the field work and asked me to step in. Um, it is, of course, also Women's Month, so it's only right that uh, we boys give the, the ladies a break. So um, I'm in for Melissa tonight. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you back to Conservation Conversations. A special welcome to those of you who are joining for the first time. Um, tonight we're going to be joined by Reason Yangera, who I see has just turned on his video. Welcome, Reason. And he's going to be telling us about fisheries and seabirds, but more about that later. You can communicate with us through the chat room and the Q&A box by typing your questions during the webinar, and our speakers will answer these at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you're tuning in on Facebook Live, we are live streaming on Facebook as well, you can send us all your questions and comments using the comment feed, and we'll check in there as well and make sure that those are answered. You can use the hashtag uh, Conservation Conversations if you'd like to engage with us over social media or to let us know that you're tuning in tonight. And be sure to catch up on any of the previous Conservation Conversations webinars you may have missed on BirdLife South Africa's YouTube channel. They're all available there for viewing again or for sending on to friends, families, colleagues who you think might enjoy them. Don't forget, you can also support the production of these webinars by donating through the Quicket platform. You can simply scan the QR code or visit the donations website on screen now. We value all of the support received so far. It's helping to keep these webinars free for all to learn and enjoy. And I think we will all back it up that this has been a most worthwhile and interesting and fruitful engagement on BirdLife's behalf. Please remember, you can sign up for our Conservation League donor competition where you stand a chance to win a brand new pair of Zeiss binoculars, please visit our website, which is www.birdlife.org.za and go to the membership tab on the drop down menu to find out more. The competition closes at the end of this month, so be sure to sign up soon to make sure you don't miss out. Next month, and this is quite exciting, BirdLife South Africa will be hosting the Virtual African Bird Fair which is a first for the continent and an event which promises to bring you the very best in all things birding from across the continent and the world. Keep an eye on BirdLife South Africa's social media feeds and website for updates. And if you are interested in being an exhibitor or a sponsor of this event, you can get in touch with Julie Bailey, our events coordinator on julie.bailey, that's B-A-Y-L-E-Y at birdlife.org.za. This really promises to be an event for the books, and I think for the first time, a truly African bird fair. The virtual platform gives us uh, a useful way to engage with people from outside of South Africa and Gauteng, which was our limitation of our physical fair. And we have really opened up to the entire African continent. So be sure not to miss out. I really think it's going to be a fantastic event. And there are some silver linings to not being able to hold a physical bird fair, as much as we will miss being at uh, Walter Susuga National Botanical Gardens. Also be sure to enter the new Jakarta Media monthly giveaway competition where you can win these four fantastic titles from Jakarta Media. Be sure to visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link to enter. This competition is only open to South African based viewers, unfortunately, so sorry for those of you who are tuning in from abroad. We will be announcing August's winner after the last webinar of this month on the 25th of August. So tonight I'm excited to welcome my colleague and good friend, Reason Nyingera. Reason is from a village called Mashingo in Zimbabwe. So, and uh, he, he grew up, um, let's say in, in different conditions to most of us. He, he grew up in a rural village on a, on a farm or a small holding. And as a child, his interest in bird was limited mainly to catching them. Um, Reason not only caught them, but also kept them in aviary. So he used to catch doves and and the like and keep them in, in cages and, and tend to them. And I think it was here that his interest in nature and birds really caught on. And he was telling me just before this webinar about the cultural importance of birds in his community and about Wungwe, 
which is the African fish eagle. Um, it's on their, their emblem and is a very important bird to him and his people back home. Reza also has a family back in Zimbabwe and his heart is really there and he gets there as often as he can. But it's a, it's a worthy question to ask how a man from Zimbabwe, and rural Zimbabwe no less, ended up working at sea on fishing boats. Um, of course, Zimbabwe is a landlocked country and uh, the idea of an albatross is something fairly unfamiliar to people in Zimbabwe. So, Reason uh, studied in, in Zimbabwe. He did uh, forestry, if I'm not incorrect, Reason, and uh, nature conservation, and then moved to South Africa after not finding work opportunities. Um, Reason actually ended up waitering at uh, the Cape Town fish market, which I guess was the first time he started dealing with fisheries. Um, in the waterfront, which is just a stone's throw from our offices here in Cape Town. And from there, it wasn't a linear progression, but from Cape Town Fish Market, he moved on to working with seabirds and then onto the fishing boats that supplied the market. So it's, it's quite a lovely story um, of how Reason ended up being here tonight and telling you about seabirds. Um, he's one of the most exemplary and loyal and wonderful people on our staff and certainly a good friend of mine. And now he's a very influential man in terms of managing fisheries for sustainable uh, catches and also reducing the risk of fisheries and fish catches to our seabirds. Reason is the Albatross Task Force Project Manager at BirdLife South Africa and he has been here for nearly five years now um, and as I said he's one of our most popular staff going around. So Reason I'm going to ask you to share your screen in the meantime and we're going to kick off with your presentation momentarily. Okay. Do you see my screen, Andrew? I can't see your screen just yet, Reason. Okay. How about now? Still not. Still not. Okay, let me go back again. How about this one? That is How good. Is it? It's good now. Yep. And you can see my presentation now. Perfect. Thank you, Reason. That's on your title slide now. So I'm going to hand over to you to take it away tonight. Okay. Thank you so much for your introduction. It's so amazing. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm so humbled to, to be part of uh, the amazing team. And I'm so humbled to have you listening to my talk today. Um, good evening, everyone. And I hope you are all doing well in this uh, uh, bad time of COVID. Um, okay, my presentation is going to be an extension of uh, uh, what Andrea Angel, one, my manager, uh, presented on, on the multifaceted approach to seabed conservation. So if uh, you want to hear more about our work, you can go on our YouTube page and then you can uh, see more on uh, what Andrea Angel spoke about. So I'm just going to add on and then I'm going to be concentrating much more on the, uh, the work which we do when we're out at sea. Uh, so, okay, let me give you my outline of my, what I'm going to, 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 to talk today. So first of all, I just want to put some disclaimer. I'm a person who thinks in Shona, Zulu, Devele, and Kosa and I translate that one to English. So sometimes, forgive me with my English, and uh, sometimes uh, when I'm talking, there's a, there's a, there's a lag in, in translation and all those things, and uh, also uh, some literal translations which happens on when I'm talking. So anyway, okay, so we are going to look at uh, why albatrosses are important, and then we're also going to look on uh, what conflicts are they having with the fishermen? And then our approach is Albatross Tax Force to that problem. And then I'm going to take you like uh, to our work when we when are out at sea, and then the solutions which we have come up with, 
and then the output of those solutions. And then we are going to talk about the present and then the future of our, of our work. So first of almost why albatrosses are so much important is because these are birds which are amazing and then they've adapted to harsh conditions of the southern uh, oceans. So they are late starters, uh, they start breeding when they are five years or more. So they also lay one egg uh, a year and sometimes they skip depending on the, the production, on the availability of food. And then also their chicks, they also grow slowly like when they are laying their chicks. It takes about 18 months for them to, 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 to fledge. And then they also, because of that, because of uh, the 13 months, they need uh, high uh, parental uh, investments, like the, the parents have to spend more time with their chicks. So they also live for a long time, like uh, about 65 years of the known one. And then they depend highly on the survival of their adults. So it makes them so much important. And then it also makes them so vulnerable to our activities as humankind. So yeah, if you look uh, like how their foraging range, uh, this uh, bed was checked in South Georgia and it's a gray headed albatross. And then it, it, it's just circulated the whole globe uh, just in a year. And then when they are outside, when they are not breeding, they even go further. And, uh, and, and, and they are so amazing in, in that regard. So they travel thousands and thousands of kilometers looking for food. Uh, so in traveling, they, 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 they face so many challenges, uh, which are the main part of it is uh, conflict with the fisheries. In South, Af in South African waters, mainly they conflict with uh, uh, troll vessels, troll vessels and uh, long line vessels. So what happens is like uh, when they the 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 the, the, the hectro vessels are fishing. They collide with uh, the hot, the the fishing gear, and also they also get caught in the nets. And then on pelagic long lining and meso long lining, that is hek long lining, and uh, the ones who are targeting tuna, they also get caught. Uh, they are attracted to the bait, and then they try to steal the bait, and then they get caught on the line, and then they they, they get killed or they get injured. So I'm going to explain uh, more about this uh, as we go. Uh, so those are the visuals of uh, what happens when they are getting caught and when they are colliding with the with the, with the warp cables. And uh, so um, because of these uh, problems, an organization was formed like, like uh, what we call Albatross Tax Force, and it was formed with the RSBB. And here in South Africa, it's housed in Bed Life South Africa. So the main objective of our team is to reduce seabed bycatch, uh, to reduce seabed bycatch, especially for the albatrosses and petrels. So we are a team of two, me and Andrea, and uh, you, uh, okay. So our approach is albatross tax was, it's like uh, we go out to sea with the fishermen because we believe that uh, we have to be, to, 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 to see the challenges on the, first event like as, 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 the, as the fishermen are working and we also believe in bottom-up method and then we use mod level approaches like to, 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 to target different levels of people from the deck to the legislatures and even to the international community as well. Sorry. Okay, cool. So, out at sea, we do research and uh, we implement uh, mitigation measures to save the seabeds. We also carry out monitoring. We monitor the, 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 uh, the progress of our mitigation measures. And then we also monitor also the abundance of seabeds. And then we monitor the, the, the activities of the fishermen as well. And then the challenges which they are facing while they are trying to reduce the catch of our seabeds. And we also work uh, out to sea, we provide awareness. So when we go out, we make sure that we, we make the fishermen aware of the importance of seabeds and then the importance of albatrosses in particular. So it's like, um, it's part of our work. And then on shore, we also do port visits, we visit the fishermen at port. While they are um, 
uh, they are working on their vessels, maybe they are refilling their vessels, or they are refurbishing their vessels, or they are waiting for the next trip. We go on the port and then we talk to them and then, and then also check if they have got uh, uh, mitigation devices on their vessels. And then if they need any information about how to save seabeds. And we also carry out uh, workshops and training of observers uh, when we are on shore as well. And then we also work with the government in uh, implementing the mitigation measures, uh, like through, through lobbying for, for, for permit conditions and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and also monitoring part of uh, uh, the use of bed mitigation devices. We also carry out workshops with the government, uh, like uh, just giving information to the people who are responsible for seabed bikeage. And we also work with other partners, uh, for example, like uh, WWF and uh, MSC, that is Marine Stewardship Council, to promote market incentive, uh, incentives to the fishermen as well so that we can promote the use of uh, uh, mitigation measures and then we can promote uh, best practice on the fishermen so that they can benefit from doing what is good and we also work with the community for example we are working with the uh, ocean view uh, association of persons with disabilities in making the bed mitigation devices making the, the devices which are going to be used by fishermen out at sea in preventing seabed package. Okay, so today I'm going to talk uh, like uh, mainly on going out at sea. So first of all, I uh, just want to, to mention this like uh, as we, we work with the fishermen, they are not actually obliged to take us out at sea. So there is no obligation for them to do so. So it's we are mainly based on the trust which we have, which we have built for a long time uh, with them so that they can allow us to be on their vessels. And then the other things like, uh, uh, it is also in the permit conditions that they need to use bed mitigation devices. So they have, uh, they come to us as well. And uh, if they are having challenges in using those bed mitigation devices, and so that we can help them in, uh, in, in getting a better way of using them, or getting or, or, or improving the, 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 the gadgets which are stop beds from being caught. So first of all, before we go out to see, to, to see like, uh, for example, you have to be mentally fit and uh, also physically fit. And then if you are feeling any, you're not well, it's not as feasible just to go out to see. So in the preparation, you have to be prepared both mentally and physically. So as we, we go out to sea, uh, first of all, it's like what I usually think of is just so amazing just to know that you are going on a mission of, of, uh, of, of, of saving seabeds. So that it gives, it always um, make me get interested in going out to know that what I'm doing is making a change and then also the team, which are, are the fishermen as well. Most of them, they are so accommodative and then they, they also willing to learn. So those things, they also encourage me to go out to sea. And then usually it's like when I'm leaving land, you know that you are not going to have internet reception. You're not going to be able to communicate with the family and all those things. It's like you just, it, it's, it's, it's just uh, so much interesting. And uh, okay, uh, when we are on the vessels, on board vessels, uh, the vessels are much more different in uh, in their in their operations and their sizes. Uh, for example, the dimensional long lining, the small vessels, they've got uh, small cabins where we sleep. Like that is the arrangement of my sleeping. For example, here on the picture, you can see. Uh, they um, would be sharing uh, a single dormitory with, uh, with about nine fishermen. So it's like we'll be using those uh, cabins for, for us to sleep. It's not a comfort, it's not as comfortable as many people might think to be out at sea. 
and on some vessels like uh, pro vessels, they've got more much bigger space and uh, even comfortable uh, cabins. And uh, some of them, they even have internet on board and all those things, luxuries, but it's only a few. But the ones which I usually go the most, like, which I usually went out with the most, that is dinosaur long lining and pelagic long lining, they are quite small vessels. And then they don't have enough space for, 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 for people because they want to maximize uh, the, uh, their, their cage. So they, they've got bigger fish holds than, than the cabins. So it's usually a challenge, which even up to now, we are not able to go on some of the vessels because they don't have enough space for, 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 for more people. Yeah, so the, the food on the, when we are out there, it's like it's organized with the, with the fishing company. So when I'm going out, I don't have to worry about the food. Everything is, uh, is loaded on land and then we are not, and then sometimes we usually like on small vessels because they don't have enough space. What they do is like they make sure that every evening after they catch their fish, and then we can have uh, any yeah, maybe pup and fish or something like that. So they also include fish as part of our 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 our, our menu. So it's like you eat fresh fish when you're out there, and uh, we there's. And also it depends, the quality of food is also depends on the, from one vessel to another, depending on the chef who is making that, that food as well. So the most uh, interesting part of uh, my, my work is uh, the social connection with the fishermen, which is our main goal. So it's like when we go out at sea, it's like we, we are trying to help the fishermen in reducing seabed package. And most of them, uh, they've been in the industry for a long time. Uh, even some of them, my age, they've been they've been out at sea like for more than forty years, and uh, and then they are still going. And just to talk to them and make them feel the importance of saving seabirds, and then showing them uh, the importance of albatrosses as well, and then the effect which we are causing on the on their population is so amazing. But on the other hand, despite of just talking about uh, the albatrosses, we also talk about our families, we also talk about football, cars, money, and everything that make uh, life interesting or something like that. So it's, it's, it's like building that relationship so that you can have your story heard. Otherwise, if you keep on talking about the base and the base and the base, sometimes you lose their concentration or you lose some other people's concentration. So it's like, for me, as soon as I get, I go on different vessels at different times. So it's like, when I go in a vessel, it's like someone who have met a new family. So I have to create that relationship with that new family. And then I have to tell the family like, what I'm there for, and then to save uh, the, 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 the seabeds. So it's like, most of the time it's like so amazing. To be to be to be interacting with people from all walks of life. So the other things like uh, you create friends, and then after creating friendship, and then you push your 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 ideas, and then you tell them about the albatrosses, and then fast fast enough, you see most. I think uh, people, most of the people we have got, we might have a tension and a feeling of thinking that fishermen are just there to, to kill birds and all those things. No, they are also much more interested in birds because they, 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 they also show them where the fish is. And then they also show them the signs. They also believe in uh, other superstitions, superstitious superstitions about birds and all those things. So it's like taking that energy and now you teach them how to identify those birds and how each and every bird behaves, and where do they do they do they breed, and uh, and 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 how much chicks do they have, and all those things. How how long do they live, and then creating that that conversation, it makes them love those uh, the seabirds more. And then whenever when they are using bed mitigation measures, 
they use it while they knowingly like we are saving the precious uh, birds. So it's like, uh, okay, now we, let me talk on how the activities which we do when we're out at sea and how we collect data on different uh, vessels. So in, uh, we, in South Africa, we have got our main fleets, uh, four vessels, these are bigger vessels, like uh, as you can see in the picture. And then we have got the MSO long line vessel, which are targeting HEC. So the HEC is a bottom feeder. So they make sure that the airline goes down. So the airline have got some weights which take the, 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 the line down, but they, they put out um, more than 15,000 hooks a day, baited hooks. And then those baited hooks attract birds. So the birds, they'll come and try to steal the baited hook and then they get caught and then they drown and die. And then also same applies to the pelagic long lining. They also set out uh, about 3,000 books a night, a pay, pay, pay set every day. And then those books, they usually use squid. And then um, albatrosses, as they are scavengers, they are also, they are attracted to the squid. And then as they try to steal away the squid, they get caught on the woods and then they get drowned. So, um, so we, we go out there to promote uh, several uh, mitigation measures, uh, mitigation measures to, to prevent the, 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 the catching of the birds. So the first more simple way of, uh, of, of preventing uh, the catch of, uh, bycatch of seabirds is just using the bird scaling lines. So the bird scaling line is just a device. It's just, as we can see on the picture, it's just a, streamers of, uh, of tubes and, uh, and, 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 and rocks, which uh, scare away the birds from the line. So as they are putting out the line, the baited hook, and then uh, they also put out the bird scaling line so that they can scare away the birds. These are massive birds and then they don't want to get close to anything that flaps. So they always avoid the area where the bird scaling line is. And we also encourage uh, night setting, especially on on uh, dimensal trow and uh, uh, dimensal long lining and uh, pelagic long lining. So we encourage them to, to set at night. And uh, we also, on pelagic long lining, they also use line weighting systems, which uh, help the, the baited hook to sink faster. And then in those uh, weights, there's uh, also some regulations and recommendations which were put like, if you put your, 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 your weight close to the hook, it sinks faster and all those things. So there are some regulations which are there. And then we go out there to facilitate to see if they are using the proper way or if they are having difficulties in using the mitigation measures which were, which were stipulated. And uh, we also have our future um, uh, devices like uh, the use of uh, uh, hook shielding devices they are being used in other places like New Zealand, but here in South Africa, they are not used yet because they, they are some, they have some challenges of being expensive. And then, and then the other things like we haven't also tested them in the South African, uh, the South African waters so that they can be approved by the fishermen as well. So that is the other thing which we are going to be working on in the future. And uh, we also encourage, uh, uh, because it's like mainly like when they, when they are catching fish, usually they process fish before they go out. So it's like when they are processing fish, they put out the discards. So we encourage them to, to manage the discards well. So to discard on the opposite side of the wall uh, or otherwise to not discarding while they are setting their lines, especially in trough vessels. So there are so many ways we we, we, we work on that. So uh, I just want to show you uh, like how effective is the bed scaling lines uh, on pelagic long lining before we go any further. So look at that picture. So what you're looking at is the setting
of tronets. So it's like as they set out the tronets, uh, there is a cable which is attached to the tronets. So on those, and then that cable is like it's not very much visual to beds, and then they get collide, they collide to the to the to the, to the cable as they are coming for the discards. As you can see on your left, there are some discards, there are some offal fish which, which are discarded from the scooper and then the birds, they come for that. So as soon as they, they put out the, the, the net, they deploy the bed scale lines. Those are the, uh, the, 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 the worst which is going out. Those are the bed scale lines. So they protect, they work as, as a curtain which protect uh, the cable which you can see. They, so that the base cannot collide with the cable. So you can see that they, there will be lots of beds which are coming for the discards. And then uh, the base scaling lines, they are there to scare away the beds. And then as you can see from these pictures, the beds are always away from, from the bed scanning lines. Of course, there are some like gannets who just, who just come, come from above and then they dive into, into the water. But those ones, they are not much affected with the warp cables. Okay, cool. So the other thing is like uh, also we, as you can see on that picture, you can see that there is a lot of birds which are attracted, especially when the net which is full of fish is coming out. So there is a cloud of birds which come on, and then uh, this affects mostly like the gannets which come in, which usually dive into the nets. So it's like for fishermen, we encourage them to 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 to, to, to reduce the time. Uh, like to, to, to hold faster, to, to pick up the, their net faster before lots of birds congregate into, into that net, especially the gannets. It doesn't affect uh, the, 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 troll, uh, the albatrosses that much. It's mainly like the cat gannets. Okay, so it's like, um, I just want to go over like the activities which we do like when we are on troll vessels. So on troll vessels, they are divided uh, the activities are they usually do trolls, three trolls a day. So what we do when we're out at sea is we usually uh, sit at the back of the vessel and then we, we watch the cable as it goes down and then we count uh, the number of interactions of uh, seabirds with, with the cable. And then we'll be also looking at the, if they are using bed mitigation device, if there's a bed scaling lines, we also look at how effective is that bed scaling line uh, in relation to, 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 the, to the collision of beds as well. So it's, uh, that is a simple, like um, what we call a measure which we, we, which we use when we recording uh, our, 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 our data. For example, we record them like there's a light interaction when the bed just collides lightly with the, with, with, with the web cable. And then there is a heavy interaction when, like for example, if a bed comes and collides with the, uh, the, 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 the warp cable and then it gets drowned into the water and then sometimes it leads to the, uh, to the death of that bed, especially if it stays under the water for a long time. Sometimes they even break wings. So we will be trying to record all those, all those informations so that we can, we, can, we can have more information about what is happening out there. And then sometimes beds are being caught in the nets and we also put those ones into record. And then we also like explain to fishermen on how they can, they can, they can alleviate that problem as well. So on the Mesa long lining, usually it's like a, a, the Mesa long lining and pelagic long lining, they have got a different setup uh, as compared to troll vessels. They have one, they usually, it's, do one set a day. And then uh, what I usually do is like during the, the set at night at around two o'clock. So I would wake up at night and then 
go and check their when they are setting and then whether they are deploying the bed scanning lines or not if they are deploying the if the bed scanning line is deployed i'll also uh, check if they have got any challenges with the bed scanning lines and then the other thing is like to see if it covers the danger zone, like the area where the, uh, the, the, the baited hoops are. So all those things is like, is what we, we, we look for. And then we work with the fishermen in trying to resolve those problems. If, uh, we, if I feel like there's, they, 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 there's a challenge there. And uh, also like uh, when they are picking up the, the, the airline, I will go up to the bridge, to the bridge, and then, or just to 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 look um, to watch as 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 the line comes in, and then we'll be counting like a number of hoops which are coming back, and then also looking up if there is a bed which is caught, and then also uh, recording if there is any interaction interactions with the with the line as it comes out, if there is any bed which is caught, sometimes. Sometimes beds are being caught, uh, get caught like uh, they did, and sometimes they, they get caught alive, and then we also help the fishermen on, on how to release a life, a life seabed. And um, yeah, so it's like, um, <coughs> so it's, it's, it's like, a, so we record the number of beds which are, which are, which are caught. Uh, for that particular time or some but for me like i've been on out on the on the vessels uh, since 2005 they i had only two events when uh, the birds were caught but recently like uh, and 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 we of course also other observers which are coming out with with uh, with, with birds that have been killed on 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 pelagic and dinosaur long running but if they are using the bed scanning lines and, uh, and and the line waiting system the number of seabirds which are being caught, they, it's, it, it is reduced drastically. And then we we'll also do research uh, on, on the vessels. Like recently, we were looking at, at, uh, at the um, sinking rate of uh, dimensional long line, uh, dimensional long lining like by putting uh, temperature depth loggers on the line so that we can see how fast it is. Uh, the line sinks and we also do experiments and uh, research on on the bed scaling lines so that we can have bed scaling lines which are very much suitable for specific vessels especially for small vessels which uh, cannot use the same size uh, uh, bed scaling lines as as the big as, as the big ones so this this uh, this graph shows uh, like uh, uh, this dinosaur long lining and how we attach uh, the temperature depth loggers on the floats and on the droppers and then see how fast does this sink and then it showed us that uh, the hooks that are close to droppers and then the hooks that are close to 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 the floats they sink much more or less as compared to the ones that are close to to the weights so this kind of like information it also give us a clear idea of where exactly can we, we we change our line or where exactly can we improve and how fast does the line sink and how long does it take uh, for it to sink below 10 meters where the beds are couldn't access the bed uh, the, the, the bait so it's it's also informed into our use of bed scaling lines and other mitigation measures as well. So we also work with the fishermen in teaching them how to handle uh, live seabeds. Most of people, they don't know exactly like what to do when the bed comes out. So it's, uh, it's some people, they take it simple and easy, but we are talking of a bed which have never been in, 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 uh, in contact with human and then it freaks out as soon as it is caught. And then we have to, to make sure that you, you hold it comfortably and be able to release it in a, in, a, in, a, in a better way. And then make sure that it's also dry and all those things. So there are so many things which we look at and then train the fishermen on how to do that. 
as well. So we, when we are out at sea as well, we also do atlasing at sea. So we, we record the densities of beds uh, on, um, for, for, for atlasing at, at sea. This is a, a program which is run through Seon and uh, Bed, Bed Life South Africa, where we are atlasing uh, the seabeds out at sea and uh, see their densities and then, yeah. So, okay, from what, we, what I was talking about, if you look at this graph, it shows that uh, uh, there are so many threats which are on, on albatrosses and petrels. Um, the main ones are intro fisheries and, and introduced uh, predators like mice. So we as albatross tax force, we have, uh, we're working with the fisheries so that we can reduce that risk which, 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 is, which is posed on, on seabeds. So we have managed from, through our work, we have managed to, to reduce seabed bycatch uh, by, for albatrosses by 90%, by 95% and for other birds by 90%. And uh, this uh, achievement has been achieved through the hard work of uh, previous ATF, uh, ATF instructors and managers uh, who Im implemented the use of bed scaling line in troll vessels. So as long as the troll vessels are using bed scaling lines, we know that they are not killing, they are, they are, they've reduced the number of, uh, of beds that are being dead, that are being killed uh, during the operations. And we also have uh, worked with the joint venture and, uh, and by facilitating and, uh, with the government and lobbying with the government so that they can put a punitive measure of uh, if they catch more than 25 beds and then they, they have to, so they, 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 there was a, a measure which was put, which led to people be cautious and then it has reduced the catch of the beds drastically. So it's through those, those initiatives. So the thing is like, if you go out at sea, you learn more about the, the challenges of fishermen and then, and then you, 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 you are able also to inform people with, uh, with, with correct information rather than uh, just assuming things that are happening when they're out there. So we have created a long-term relationship with the fishermen in such a way that they, they, they trust us and then as soon as we are there, they also look for ideas and where exactly they can improve and, uh, and that, is, uh, that, is what we, that is what we makes us happy. And we also, from the information which we get when we are out at sea, we come on land and then we inform uh, the, the, the stakeholders, especially the government, the decision makers, and show them the challenges which the fishermen are facing. Otherwise, sometimes we have found out that uh, there are some, some rules which are, just put, which are just put as a blanket, which doesn't apply to all the vessels and all those things. So the other thing is like we work with, with, with the government and try to explain and to show them exactly what are the challenges which are happening out there. And we also, from the information which we get when we're out at sea, we also train the government uh, uh, fisheries compliance personnel in, uh, in the mitigation measures and teach them how do they look like and then the challenges which, are, which the fishermen are facing when they're out there and then what they you have to look out for when they are doing some inspection of the vessels because some of the people they might not be aware much about it because they, they haven't worked so much close to the, the seabeds. So if uh, we take that information as people who have been out there with the fishermen and then take it into the, into the, into the compliance officers so that they can be aware of the challenges which uh, the, the, the beds are facing out there. And we also transfer that uh, information to observers, to other observers, in national observers and regional and even scientists. So it's like it's taking that information which we have and what we have learned when we are out at sea and then teach uh, the observers who also go out at sea and to show them what they have to look out for when they are out at sea. And we also 
disseminate our information to uh, schools, uh, just um, to to make uh, to, to what what is the word to to encourage young scientists in, on uh, on the importance of saving our seabirds and uh, the biodiversity in general. So we also work with the with the Ocean View um, Association of Persons with Disability in making the bed the bed scaling lines, which are which are going to be used on 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 the vessels. And then this will help because it's like we will be using uh, the information we will be using the rightful information which we have collected out at sea and then see what uh, device which doesn't uh, entangle with, uh, with the gear so that we can have a, a perfect device to use when we are at sea. And so what are we doing uh, during this uh, pandemic? Um, uh, we just relaxing, sleeping and twittering and all those things. No. I think that is, we are not doing that. So what we do is uh, we keep the, our engagement with the fishermen, even by visiting, uh, by doing port visit. Of course, that uh, picture was taken long time back before social distancing, but presently it will be social distancing and using the masks and all those things, but uh, engaging with the fishermen indirectly because we believe like what is, out of sight is out of mind. So we usually want ourselves to be, to be there, to show that we are still around and then we still working with them. And then we still, the, 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 the problem of seabed package is not something which is solved in one day. It's, it's a continuous thing. Um, and also we supply bed scan lines to our fisheries. We keep on the supplies so that uh, the, the, the vessels will go out with, uh, with um, bed scaling lines. And these uh, lines, sometimes they get worn out and then they need to be replaced. And then we have to keep on those supplies so that uh, we are so sure that the vessels are taking uh, the bed mitigation measures seriously. And we also looking at uh, like what we call smart approach uh, during this uh, the pandemic is like uh, we have seen like how uh, the world can change and then we need to look at other other measures which are like electronic monitoring and then uh, he, like are uh, trying to track the use of bed mitigation measures uh, when we are not actually on the vessel like use of uh, um, bed monitoring devices like the one which is being developed with the Invelo. And uh, we also uh, work on like uh, collecting data uh, and data management, data sharing, trying to put everything online and then so that we can have a, a different approach from what we are using. Of course, we are not going to stop going out to see is that is the most important thing. But now with the knowledge which we have got of being out at sea, we know exactly if the if you can see, like if you can uh, download a track of a vessel, we can know when it is fishing. And uh, the, by seeing those characteristics, we can even see like uh, uh, if they have set during the day or set during the night and all those things. And then we can inform uh, like decision makers on that. And we're also moving forward to use uh, Global Fish Watch, uh, Fishing Watch data. Uh, this is, um, yeah, this is what uh, it's 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 it's, uh, it's the tracking of uh, the, the the fishing vessels uh, using automatic uh, sorry using automatic um, I I S no, sorry automatic uh, sorry sorry okay so it's uh, it's the tracking of uh, of of is the tracking of uh, of fishing vessels using satellite data so it's like uh, the global fishing watch is managing a lot of data from uh, from from fishing fishing vessel tracks like so we are downloading those uh, fishing tracks and then we try to overlay those fishing tracks with uh, with seabirds tracking data 
So we are also working on, on downloading the, uh, on using of uh, CBES tracking data. CBES tracking, tracking data on, uh, on, 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 on the system. So, so by overlaying the tracking, the, the, the tracking of seabeds and, uh, and, and the vessel tracking data, we can find like the, uh, sorry, yeah. Okay, so the other things like um, what, what better can we do? Can we, we do better? And we also want to thank uh, the, uh, the, the, our partners and uh, people who have contributed in our work. Uh, that is including um, our sponsors, uh, the fishing industry, the fishing associations, and uh, the, ocean view, the Ocean View. And we also want to thank uh, our other partners, which we are working with and, and across the globe. And thank you so much. Wow, Reason, uh, that was phenomenal. I know that uh, giving presentations is not your favorite thing. So we have to uh, keep in mind that this is your fourth language. And I think just you gave such a, a wonderful insight into what life is like out at sea. And, um, you know, how, how important that, that human aspect is for, for, for fisheries and, and seabird conservation. Um, I personally always love it when you come back from a trip because when you when you do, you often bring fresh fish back to the office. So my, my family thanks you for all the lovely heck dinners we've had on the back of your fishing trips. <laughs> I'm going to miss that when I move to Johannesburg. And uh, yeah, I was just thinking, you know, people say uh, there's this phrase, the coal face of conservation. And I, I think, you know, what, what you showed us here, the, the difficulty of living and working at sea, um, this, this is the coal face of conservation. And, and dealing with people who, who are on the ground, you know, making actions and, and possibly making a difference, you know, either for the good or for the worse of these different species that you're working with. Um, you know, it's a combination of physical stamina, long nights out there at sea, being away from family and being away from your phone, but then also the research skills to pull off the science involved and the interpersonal skills to, to convince the hearts and minds of the fishermen out there. Um, and it, it's just phenomenal the amount of work and the results that the ATF has produced. This is, I see a few comments coming in the, in the chat box now. There's, this is one of BirdLife South Africa's most successful conservation projects. And it's, it's on the back of a long line of people, but a very, very small team. So, you know, yourself, Andrea, Bronwyn Marie, who's just joined BirdLife again, actually. It's the East Atlantic Flyway Initiative Coordinator. Um, Bokomoso Lebepe, who's now working with WWF and, and still working on fishing issues and making a difference. Now these, these are the names that have made a real, real difference. The, the number of albatrosses saved at sea because of quite simple measures is, is actually phenomenal. So the ATF has done so, so well. And it's, it's good to get a, an on the ground look at what your work actually looks like. You know? At the end of the day, you are actually saving species. Um, and that's, that's a phenomenal thing. Um, you know, I, was, I was also thinking about how important people are and, and convincing the fishermen that, that it's important to look after birds. You know, at the end of the day, conservation can't happen these days without people and convincing people that it's important. When you talk about convincing the, the fishermen that birds are important and that they should care about the birds. And I also think about the cigarette and alcohol bans at the moment. You know, if you make a law that the people don't buy into it, there's going to be large scale disobedience and spurs on a black market of cigarettes and that. So if you can convince the people who are at the coal face making the decisions that these are important decisions and they do the right thing, then you've won the battle. So it's really important work that you're doing reason and, and well done. We're going to go through uh, a few different points now before we get to the questions, you can pop those questions in the Q and A box if you haven't already. Reason I see that the questions are ticking up. You're almost at uh, 25 questions already. We'll get through as many as we can. Um, before we uh, do take those questions, a reminder to everyone to please participate in the post webinar survey, which will pop up when you exit the webinar. There's some questions there that will be very useful for you to answer uh, 
um, for reason and for BirdLife as a whole. Um, also, if you're not yet a member of BirdLife South Africa, there'll be some contact details there that um, you can either leave your contact details and we'll get in touch with you, or, or um, you can get in contact with us and those details will be there. Next week, we will have an insightful panel of speakers discussing the impacts of lead on South Africa's wildlife. So you can join BirdLife South Africa's Linda van and Eerpe, Prof Vinnie Naidu, Lizanne Nell and Ian Rushworth as they unpack the challenges faced by wildlife through the use of lead products in hunting and fishing industries. Be sure to tune in for this webinar at 7 p.m. next week, Tuesday. If you have any questions, as I said, please do pop them in. Um, we are going to get ahead with some of those now. The reason there was a question quite early on um, when I'd just given your intro about where you've come from in Zimbabwe and um, your whole story of getting to where you are now, which is so inspiring. Um, and you shared it with all of us staff uh, just recently. There was a question about, and I think this was the same question I actually asked you in that staff meeting. How do you explain to your community back home? How, how do you explain to your two young daughters what an albatross is and what the work is that you do and why it's important? Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, I think it's generally, it's like how, for me, I've taken a general approach, approach to conservation uh, in such a way that anything that has to do with wildlife and um, our biodiversity is just, I treat them collectively. It doesn't matter whether it's eaten an albatross or is it an African fish eagle or is it, a, is, it a, is it a penguin or is it a snake? So those things like I just put it in a general that we are conserving our biodiversity. We are conserving our wildlife. We are conserving our trees. We are conserving our habitats. Yeah, so generally it's like they don't know much about uh, seabirds. And then most of the people, like if you talk about albatrosses, for example, from my place, they say that, are they edible? That is the question which they ask sometimes. So it's like, I said, no, 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 they are not. They are almost the same as vouchers and stuff like that. And then, um, yeah, but uh, it's quite interesting. I've never thought that one day I'll be in this field. And then it happens that I'm here. Thank you so much. I think you answered, I don't know. Yeah, no, that was great, yeah. Um, yeah. Really, there's a, also a question here on how long do you go out on these trips for? Yeah, usually it's like it depends on, uh, on the fishing vessels type because there are some vessels which go out for two weeks and then there are some which usually go for seven days and then there are uh, the, the freezer vessels which go out for almost uh, two months and uh, if you go for the international ones they go for six months but for me I, I was only doing the local ones because it's like I'm not actually being from Zim I'm not allowed to be on the on the foreign vessels here in South Africa so I'm only always like doing the local ones which go out for two weeks maximum two weeks yeah somewhere like okay and uh, what do you think is the biggest adjustment for you coming from being land-based, spending so much time at sea, and then when you come back to land again? Okay. In, first of all, like the first two days when you, uh, okay, first day when you go out, you, you'll be not feeling well because you still have that uh, again. You're still trying to, to adjust to the sea conditions because it's like to the rolling of, 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 of the fishing vessels of which those roles depends on the fishing vessels as well. Like uh, the, 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 the dimensional long liners, most of them, they are wooden vessels and then they roll a lot. And then it's so much difficult for you to, to adjust. You can take maybe two days to adjust to that, to that kind of like system. Uh, first of all, like as for me, I, I, do, I can say that I get, I can say that I get seasick, but I don't think it's, it's it's not a hectic seasick. I just change my eating patterns and stuff like that. And then sometimes I eat less, sometimes I, yeah. So, so that kind of like adjustment. And then depending on the sea trip on its own, if it was so rough, coming back on land, sometimes I spent almost three days without, or, or even most, almost a week without 
be able to like without getting good sleep like it's like uh, i just can't sleep when i'm back on land i'll be liking that uh, like uh, for me to sleep it's like the rolling part of the vessel is still in my head and then i sleep a lot when i'm out at sea and then when i'm back i can't sometimes okay yeah amazing there's some uh, key tips in there for those of you who are going to be joining us on Flop to Marry in 2022. Um, so yeah, but that one is going to be comfortable, Andrew. <laughs> it's a comfortable I think it's going to be a lot more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at those, uh, those cabin pictures you showed us with the nine people in the dormitory, it's going no, to be... We are, not going, <laughs> we are not going to put our, our, our fellow partners on that one. <laughs> no, not at all. It's going to be a very comfortable trip and I think... Uh, the stabilizers on that boat are much better than the smaller boats that you get out on. And that's going to be a fantastic trip. The reason you kind of answered it already, um, but there's a question from Kedi Janssen from Rendsburg. He asks, do you interact with foreign fishermen or only South African fishermen? I know you mentioned you can't go on the foreign boats, but maybe you want to talk, talk about um, the foreign okay, boats. Okay, so we, 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 we have got uh, some foreign vessels which, uh, which join venture with uh, with our local uh, rights holders. Uh, those ones are usually, we, we, we interact with them. We debrief their, uh, their captains and observers. And then they must always have an observer on board, which is provided by South Africa, by agencies from South Africa. And then we usually work with them. And then there are some foreign vessels which just come to review here or to or to 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 what do we call to pay their catch here in South Africa? Uh, we used to have a program which was running through common oceans, which was looking on those ones. But now we we, we don't have any pro project now. But we, yeah, we mm -hmm. once did and we are not now. Okay, and uh, it's Women's Month reason, and uh, Marilyn Aitken has asked, are there any women fishermen on these boats? Yes, there are women fishermen, especially on the troll vessels, they are women fishermen. But uh, they, 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 their numbers, as compared to, to, to male, they are quite low. And then the other, I apologize if I was using the word fishermen, it's something which I've just used to use. Uh, could I just have, say, fishers? So, yeah, so they are women, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that's just a habit for all of us, eh? Yeah. Um, so, Tanya Anderson wants to know a reason why in that video were they discarding at the same time that their nets were being deployed? Um, shouldn't they wait until those nets have gone down before discarding to keep those birds away? Okay, cool. Uh, that is a very good question. So, the thing is like, uh, that also comes to their production as well. And then the quality of fish, which they, they, they are targeting all, always for best fish. So as soon as it gets on board, and then they have to make sure that it's processed before it gets, uh, it's lost its value or something like that. So they, as soon as the net is out, is in, and then they, then they, dip, they, 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 they start uh, to process in the, in the, in the factory. So usually, so that's why we encourage as soon as the, the door, you see there was a metal thing which went down and then as soon as that metal thing went down because it's the one which usually uh, entangles with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the bed scaling lines. So as soon as it goes down, then they have to deploy the bed scaling line. In essence, like this, for fishermen who are more like, uh, more sensitive to, to they, they, sh they, they should stop for those 15, 16 seconds before the bed scaling lines is out. So it's also on the communications and other things which are also include, included. It's, yeah, it's operational things sometimes that we've got. And then Sarah Charlton wants to know, is there any disadvantage to the fishing vessels using the bird scaring lines? You know, is there any reason that they wouldn't want to use them? Okay, so the main disadvantage is uh, some fishermen, for example, long liners, pelagic dimensional long liners, and pelagic long liners. They say that it entangles with the with their with their gear, 
So if it gets hooked to one of the hooks and then it's going to affect their, uh, their, their operation, they have to stop and then they have to, 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 to remove it and those things. So sometimes they feel like uh, they losing out of using it. But uh, that's where we are coming in as bed life so that we can have a bed scan line which doesn't affect their catch and then which doesn't ha affect their operations and then uh, which is cumbersome to them which they can use uh, happily enough. But if it doesn't entangle with the gear then it doesn't have any effect on them. So, but the other, things, the other mitigation measures which have got a kind of like effect on their catch which we feel like they it have got effect on their cage. Uh, for example, in the pelagic long liners, is the use of uh, the weights, the weighting regime. Mm -hmm. So, like the uh, tuna, tuna and uh, and swordfish and all these things, they are game uh, game fish. They are so much sensitive to anything that is uh, that is close to the to their bait and stuff like that. So they. Yeah, so they, they face a challenge on that one. But there are some other devices which we are trying to put in, like the use of luma leads, and then the use of uh, bed shielding devices like the hook pods, which we are trying to promote for the fishermen to use, which doesn't affect their catches. Mm. I guess that's, that's the first hurdle, is trying to convince them that it won't have an effect on their fishing, and then they'll be happy enough to, to put those yes. lines out and those measures in hey. Yeah, and then they'll be even more happy if there's a superstition behind that. If you use this one, it catches more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so reason is, there's uh, two follow-up questions to that. The first one's from Judy Stockhill, and, and she says may, maybe there, there isn't a negative effect on catches. Maybe there's a benefit to the fishermen because they're not sharing their catches with the seabirds. Yes, yes, in that, in that regard, Okay, it brings me, it, it brings me back to the to the to the to the to the invention of uh, the bed scaling line. So the bed scaling line wasn't invented with us as a TFO conservationist. It was invented with uh, fishermen who was tired of catching birds instead of fish. So they've got uh, a huge uh, yeah, 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 value. Like where you were supposed to catch. Uh, a half a million whatever tuna while there is a bed on so it you have lost so i think we also encourage them in that way as well yes and then and then you also mentioned um superstitions there so diana cowan wants to know um if you can tell them a couple of superstitions around birds that you've heard from fishermen before <laughs> uh i think the, the problem with these superstitions they differ from one person to another and I uh, was on this other vessel and I uh, had uh, this guy who was always telling if he sees uh, what we call this um, uh, giant petrel, you'll be saying that one, that one is not good, that one is not good. It's like he doesn't want to switch around <laughs> otherwise. And then if they see like the blackbirds, like uh, they say blackbirds if they're referring to white chin petrels, and then they'll say that it's nice, today is going to, and then they also use it. For weather as well. For example, if they hear the sounds of uh, the pendados and other things, they know bad weather is coming. And then uh, if they see some albatrosses, uh, some uh, and and also like um, things like uh, gulls and stuff, when they are close to land, they know that we are not going to catch. If there are gulls here, we are not going to catch enough or something like that. So they use all those all those. Uh, yeah, of which some of them they were just passed from their generations to generations. Yeah, I don't know if you know the, the story of the Afrikaans name for terns, but the, the terns are called sterakis, which means little stars. And the, the legend I've heard is that the terns um, tell fishermen where, where the fish are because they can see the flocks of them diving onto the bait fish. And they used that's a star because it's like the story in the Bible where the star showed them where Jesus was being born. So that's why terms are called statikis. Have you heard that one? No, oh, it's the first time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, moving on then. So Michael Wright wants to know when a bird is unfortunately killed and it's brought on board, 
do the fishermen ever cook and eat it? Yeah, there is, uh, now they are not doing it, but there is some old stories which uh, they used to feed on, on birds. Uh, and uh, also like um, in places like Tristan uh, Island, they also eat uh, like the shear waters. Um, so, but uh, in South African waters, uh, in South African fisheries, they, they don't eat. They, they used to do that long time back, but now they, they don't. I think now because even they've got good food supplies, fresh bread, fresh everything, fresh uh, chicken and everything. So they, they are not wanting for any other forms of food. Mm, I guess you've, you've got all this fresh fish on the boat, which is so delicious. Why yeah, 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 yeah. But, <laughs> but if you have got only fresh fish without the chicken and then the beef and the stuff, and then you just need... So I think the old fishermen who couldn't carry all those stuffs they could just have uh, another, yeah, you yeah. know. For now, for these days, what we do is like, if the bed is caught, uh, we bring it back uh, on land. It's like, uh, it's also in the legislation that it needs to come back on the land so that, and then we as bed life will take it for research. So we take it to Peter Ryan, who is working on the plastics, and then the other, like, uh, but DNA things and other scientific stuff. So you, yeah, so that is what we do. Yeah, I, I uh, had to take a few, I think uh, seven gannets once to UCT and I don't think my cars ever smelled the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, moving on from that one. Um, so Florian Augere wants to know, what are the species that are most attracted by the fisheries boats? What, what are the most common ones you've seen behind the boats? And then also, okay. maybe, and can you also talk about how the competition is between the birds? Okay, okay, cool. So the most common birds which we find, especially here in South African waters, is white chin petrels. And uh, there's also black broad albatrosses. And then there's white chin, uh, shy albatrosses, and uh, pendados, uh, seasonal as well. And then we have got shear waters, um, red shear waters, and cori shear waters. And uh, we also have um, uh, the yellow nose, both Antarctic and, uh, and but, yeah. And then we also have uh, southern giant petrel but they are in less numbers, they're not as much. So the most like um, common ones, you can say that is white chin betrayal, and then followed by black broad albatrosses. And then we put uh, the pendados, like they come like in seasons and then there'll be lots of them. And we we'll also have some gannets, and gulls and uh, what we call up and Arctic skewers and stuff like yes, that. Yes. But, uh, yeah. So the, the, the thing is like they also behave differently. Uh, usually the shy is the one which is much more bigger than the others is compared to these ones and then it always wins the big fish most of the time. And, um, and the pendados they just go for the little yeah discards which is a, and something which is broken in those. Yeah, so uh, yeah, and these, uh, these they, 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 they can, they, sometimes they chase each other and stuff like that while it's watching and then there's fights and, but not, yeah. Yeah, I think by my experience reason, and you can agree with me or disagree with me, it's yeah. usually just the bigger birds are the more aggressive and tend to win the fights, so. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Um, Reason Penny Abbott wants to know what mitigation measures that you mentioned are actually contained in the permit conditions? What are the legal requirements? Okay, so it's like, um, okay, the, we have got uh, several fisheries and then those, those fishing fleets or those fisheries have got different uh, uh, permit conditions. For example, in the pelagic long lining, we have got uh, use of bed scanning line use of line weighting system, like uh, weighting your branch lines. And then we have got uh, the discards management of these discards, like discarding on the other side of the, uh, did I talk about the fishing at night as well? I think, I'm repeating it, I don't know. So, oh, again. 
Yeah, but they are allowed to use only two of, 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 of the three. So that is pelagic long learning. And then in dimensional long learning, uh, they've got uh, use of bed scanning lines, setting at night, and uh, use of right uh, line weighting. They have to like, and then the spacing of their, uh, their weights as well. So usually they should use two of those ones. Yeah, but uh, on dimensional long line, we are still working on, 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 the, on the weighting system because the weighting system, which is recommended with, uh, with, the, with the permit conditions, is not, it's not feasible on the vessels. So it's something which we are working on mm -hmm. right now. And then reason, is there some kind of certification scheme? This one's from Arda van Dongen. Is there some kind of certification which shows that the fish is caught by you know, bird-friendly vessels, pe people that are following the rules? Okay, so that's why I talked about uh, the market incentive initiatives, like uh, we, we have got uh, MSC, uh, which, uh, which is Marine Stewardship Council, which is mainly like, uh, but that one is it's more advantageous to the exporting marketing, like uh, in Europe, especially in Europe. So it's like they can, that system can follow, you can have a trail of the fish up to where it was caught and whether the bed scaling line was used or not, if you want to follow on that. So it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, cumbersome, it's quite, it's, it's quite good. And uh, there is also SASI, which is a local, um, okay, I think people will search their acronyms. And then uh, that is also like, which informs uh, the, 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 the buyers whether the fish is being caught sustainably or not. Yeah, I think SASI is the, the South African Sustainable Seafood Initiative. I think that's what it stands yes. for. And it's yeah. produced by our colleagues at WWF, if I'm not wrong. And it's a free to download app as well. So when you're next buying fish, you can um, look up on the app whether it's a sustainably caught species, if it's endangered, um, and make sure that your eating habits are sustainable as well. Reason, um, do the birds ever get used to the bird scaring lines, which, which makes bird scaring lines less effective, or are they always effective? Uh, no, they, they, they don't get used to bed, the bed scaring lines, especially the albatrosses, because they are quite massive birds and then they don't need anything that is flipping around close to them. So mm -hmm. just avoid it. Uh, but for gannets, the gannets is like some, most of the times they fly from above and then they just dive down. So sometimes it's not much effective for gannets. Uh, but uh, the things like they are, they, they, they are, the gunners, they've got a sharp view and then they are divers and all those things. So they see precisely on what they want to, to catch. So usually I, have, I haven't seen uh, the collision of uh, the gunners on the cables. Of course it happens, but uh, me personally, when I went out on the trove vessels, I haven't seen that. And then Reason, I think you talked about this a little bit, but maybe a little bit more um, for Jane Doherty. Do you face yeah. any resistance from fishery owners or captains of the boats or the fishermen themselves to the various bycatch prevention measures that you, you introduce to them? And, and why, why do you get some backlash? Okay, uh, yes, of course. Sometimes you face resistance because it's like, as soon as you get, they, people, they always become suspicious of thinking that you are, trying to reduce their catch. And uh, sometimes they just uh, say, okay, we are using this or something like that. Or like they try to avoid the topic or things like that. Or some of, there are few people who I can say that they have resist, resisted totally. But the things like uh, we, we, we face those kind of like trying to, they try to dodge uh, like, uh, yeah, from, from those things. But um, I cannot use resistant as such, but they, always like dodge uh, the use of uh, those bed, bed medication measures. Hmm. And then a, a related question from George Ledeck. He asks, if you, if you find non-compliance with the bird mitigation requirements on the boats, do you report this to the authorities and what happens? 
Okay, so it's, um, if I find non-compliance, like is 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 me on bed life? Because first of all, like when we go out to sea, it's like uh, we we are there to help the fishermen in trying to reduce seabed package, and then we are not there as compliance. So it's like we are there as scientists, our research, we are collecting information. So if we find a bed which that, a, a vessel which doesn't deploy bed scale lines or which doesn't use it's like, first of all, we try to look on what is the challenge is, what makes them not deploy the bed scanning line. Can we do anything better? Can we encourage them and all those things? So, and then if now they keep on not doing it, that's where we report uh, the, the, them to the authorities. I know a uh, reason that you know this, but I'm gonna bring it up for the rest of the attendees. I was out on a fishing trip um, not this last weekend, the one before, and actually photographed a, a trawler that wasn't flying its bird scaring lines. And um, you, you, I sent a picture to you and Andrea, and you, you very quickly were able to get in touch with the fishing company owners. And you have such a good relationship with them that through Responsible Fisheries Alliance and all of these, that you can have that conversation with them and they, they buy into it. So there's, there's a good yeah. working relationship there. And then, and then what usually happens is like we also, if something like that happens, it's like we talk to the fishing industry, to RFA and all those things. And then we go for a kind of like, a, we can say that it's a hearing. I don't, I don't want to use strange words. I don't know which ones are good or which ones are not. But it's like we sit down with the, with the, with the captain who was in charge of that and then try to teach him and, uh, and ask like having his own opinion why he was doing it like that and all those things, yeah. Hmm. Reason, there's a question from Lungile Kaba Gavinda, and uh, they want to know, why are bird scaring lines yellow? <laughs> okay, so the generally it's like our ocean is blue in color because it's reflecting from the sky or something like that. I don't know why it's, it's blue, but it's blue. So it's like yellow, it's much more contrast to the blue color. So that's why they're yellow. Uh, and also it's like beds are also very good, sensitive to, 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 to what you call to colors. I think Andrew, you can explain more on that. <laughs> yeah, of course we know birds um, see in the color spectrum and actually on, on spectra that are beyond human vision sometimes. So. So color is very important and the brighter it is, the more obvious it is. Those gray cables going into the blue water are not very obvious, but if you have those nice brightly colored, fast moving bird scaring lines, then there's no doubt that the birds will see them. So, so that's great. Um, yeah. Reason, what happens to injured birds? Ted Pan Merlin wants to know. So, yeah, so it's, uh, it depends on where it is injured on. Uh, if it is a broken wing, uh, when we are out at sea, there are very much low chances that uh, the bird will survive. Was it a, a bird with a broken wing is just the same as a dead bird. So usually it's like we, uh, we, we, we release it. And yeah, but uh, then we just think, we just pray that it's going to be fine. And uh, the, if it is broken on some way, we can, if it is, we, we are able to bring it back on land, we can take it to, to the, to the uh, sun cop for them to attend it or, yeah. So if there is a chance that it can be rehabilitated, we can take it to the rehabilitation centers. But the other thing that when we are out at sea, maybe you are, it's your first day there out there and then you have to keep it for a long time. Sometimes we can try to take care of it yeah, it depends. I haven't, I haven't got that experience yet, but um, yeah, I think it depends on how the in, where it is injured and how bad is the injury. Okay, and then reason from from Constant Hughes Traherne, he wants to know um, how long do the demersal and pelagic long lines actually stay in the water? Demersal. Well, demersal and pelagic long lines, how, how long? Okay, so the, the dimensional long line, we have got, uh, the dimensional long line, they have, they've got two kind of like fleets. There is wet fish and then there is a freezer. The freezer vessels, they go almost for 20 days to 30 days. 
and uh, the wet fish are for dimensa or long learning. They go out for seven days to eight days, 10 days, 12, depending, but uh, usually it's like that. Time. Because they are, used, they are putting their fish on ice, so there is a time lapse on the ice as well. And then the quality of the fish. Okay. Um, there's been a question again from Penny Abbott, who's asked about ASAS, the Atlas of Seabirds at Sea project. And I'm, I'm going to take this question if that's okay, Reason. Um, she's asked, how do we access the data from the Atlas at Sea project? So, Penny, there's a, there's a website online, seabirds.sayon.ac.za, and that's the home site for the um, Atlas of Seabirds project. You can find all the information there. It is an open source database. Anyone is welcome to download and use that information. Um, guys like Reason go out and collect it. We have various observers on different boats. Um, and that's a project that I, until about two months ago, used to run. So that's why I'm, I'm taking over that section from Reason. But he's, he's one of our top contributors um, out at sea. Reason, we're getting quite close on time now. I'm just going to ask you maybe two or three more questions if you don't mind. Um, there's another one from Florian Augere. He's asking about illegal fishing and regulating illegal catch and illegal fishing. So vessels that are not meant to be in our waters or boats that are going over their permit or catching illegal species. How do you think in future the best way is going to be to quantify that and to protect against that? So you can say that again? So, so the illegal boats, reason the yes. illegal fishing that's taking place. What do you think in the future is going to be the best way to counteract that threat of illegal fishing? Um, the best way we global fish watch is another way to go. It is also flashes out uh, the illegal fish fishing vessels. Uh, if you go on uh, global fish watch website, you can see they they even have some articles where they were able to identify illegal fishing and then they also be able to identify vessels that are fishing maybe in the marine protected areas and all those things is a way to go and then uh, recently like uh, previously people were just using uh, like um, compliance uh, vessels uh, like here yeah, this Arabatam is it yeah the one which we've been using uh, to just uh, go around the, the, the our shows and look for illegal vessels but i don't think that is much more effective but i hope uh, global fish watch is going to be able to address some of the, the challenges in the future and yeah in the I, think, I think you've got it on the head there i think global fish watch is basically the big brother of fishing right now it's watching everyone yeah. and uh, it can pick up you know odd signals from boats in areas they're not meant to be in. I think that's going to be the way forward and it's going to really do a lot to counteract that threat. Um, yeah. Reason, there's, there's two more questions I'm going to ask you and they, they're quite nice ones, I think. Yvonne Pennington, who's, who's on our board and you probably know her, she wants to know what is your favorite seabird species and why? Uh, my favorite seabird is, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to be, uh, it's a pendant. It's not an but for say such. <laughs> so it's a small colorful bed. And then uh, when I'm out at sea, there, it's like, it's energy. Because it's like most of the, uh, the, 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 the sea birds are huge and massive, and then they are not much more active as, as, as compared to the, to the Pendado Petro. So I like that, that energy in it. And then it looks like a pigeon, and it's, you can relate to something that is on land and stuff like that. So yeah. And uh, on the albatross side is the wandering albatross. Wonders, okay. Yeah. Fantastic. And reason your last question for the evening before we let you go. We're only one minute over time, so we've done quite well. And this one's from Michael Wright. And he wants to know what is the most amazing and memorable sighting you've enjoyed at sea to date, even if it wasn't a seabird? Um, to date, memorable sight. Uh, I have to think on this. <laughs> I, I thought I thought it was going to be easy. I, th I thought you were going to say killer whales or orcas. Killer whales. Um, I haven't seen them up close in the fishing vessels. I used I saw it while I was doing my MSc. So yeah, it uh, it was quite good. And um, 
I can say that I would say that uh, when I went on a pelagic long line trip, uh, that was my first time to see uh, them catching like a swordfish. So it was which I always used to see in the books, like there's a fish with a sword kind of like thing. So the time when it got up, I just, what? And also the, 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 the Dorado, like the way it was like uh, flashes in the, in, the, in the water and reflecting and all those things, the colorfulness of it, while it is, it is being lured or something like that, it was quite amazing experience. So I think uh, those ones. Mm, I think next time you'd have to do a presentation reason, you're going to have to put pictures of those different fish, I think, into the, into the talk. I think people would find that very interesting. Um, yeah. I'm quite surprised you went for two fish as your favorite sightings instead of birds. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> and, I think, yeah. I think, um, I think Mark's going to have to be looking for a contract tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the problem with the birds is like they are so abundant around you. So it's like, they, it's like clouds of birds around you every day. Mm. So you see them, you get excited, but that excitement goes away because there is a lot of them coming in. And yeah. all the time you see them. Yeah. And no, then really? even, like I've, I've even stopped taking more pictures of seabirds because there are lots of them around you. <laughs> <laughs> Just in, in closing, y Yvonne Pennington says that the Pintado petrel is also her favorite seabird. Um, it, because it's pretty, but also because it's the easiest to identify. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll ask Yvonne to point out all the Pintado petrels on, on the way down to Marion. Um, Reason, I'm going to stop you there. We're now five minutes over time. But thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I think we've all really enjoyed that. There's been a lot of supportive and grateful messages in the chat. So I'm going to give people two more minutes once we close up here just to uh, type those into the chat box if they want to say thank you or ask any other questions, we can answer them in there if you'd like. Uh, just a reminder to all of you that these webinars happen every week and we're going to have a wonderful one on the impact of lead poisoning in South Africa's wildlife. Um, and that's gonna be a joint presentation between four different stakeholders, one from BirdLife and then other people from different uh, groups from academics to hunting organizations. So that's gonna be a fascinating webinar as well. And then in the coming weeks, again, um, every week, Tuesday night at 7 p.m., um, you can use the same link you used to log into this webinar. And all that remains to say is thank you, Reason. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. And a good night to all of you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. It was. Good night. <laughs>